House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development um, here to have a discussion on uh, what our friends at Commerce, at the Agency of Commerce Community Development um, have, um, what they have to report to us on the grant program, how things are going and um, what we have to look forward to. So with us is Deputy Secretary Ted Brady this morning. Ted, welcome. We're glad that uh, you were you, you were able to join us. And we have Commissioner Goldstein with us also. Good to see you, Joan. Good to see you. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So if, yeah, Charlie? No. Sorry. Oh, so uh, I don't know, Ted or Joan or both, however you want to lead no. off and just probably give us a an idea how things are going with the grants and, and uh, you know, the positives and what it, where are the negatives, what do we have to do going forward? And maybe we can get into some of um, the discussion on, on uh, what the governor laid out last week um, on the new programs and, and go from there. Yeah, so I think that's probably makes sense then because Joan uh, has not slept in, I don't know, three months that she should uh, take us through where we are on the grant program and give you the general grant update and then maybe pass it back to me for uh, an update on where we're going and what we've proposed, what the governor and the agency have proposed together to try to uh, tackle what we've learned, the lessons we've learned. Sound good, Joan? That sounds great. Um, so I know I that, can, yeah. Uh, I just wanna uh, remind everyone um, in the committee to please mute. Um, so we don't get any feedback and uh, we're able to hear Joan and Ted a lot easier. Thank you. So go Yeah, I don't know where to begin, um, but I think if I could just say that the combination of um, ACCD and tax, um, we were able to process thousands of applications and about a little over 3,000 people have been paid already. The breakdown um, between tax and ACCD is that tax has a great system, my VTAX, that they were able to do a significant amount of solicitation and application and processing all in very quickly. ACCDs was a very different situation. We set up a Salesforce application with a two-step review and approval process. And so it's taking us a bit longer to process, but even having said that, we had the help of uh, Department of Finance and Regulation and VITA and basically everybody in ACCD helping out to review and then subsequently to the management team for approval. Um, I think, and I'm hoping that the committee has the full on legislative report and sorry that I didn't maybe could circulate that or unless you have that handy, you'll be able to see a bit about the distribution around the state, the distribution in terms of the, um, the, the sector distribution that ACCD had, as you know, tax did the um, sort of retail and, and lodging and hospitality properties, and we did everybody else. Um, uh, the distribution is really much more skewed on the small business side. You'll see the majority of the funds went to those that are like four and under in terms of number of, of employees. Um, we also had a fair amount, as you know, on the sole proprietorship. So the good news is that you know we were able to get this done. Uh, it's still ongoing, although our numbers are uh, significantly uh, down, like the velocity of incoming is down. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, you know obviously there were gaps, right? So the gaps are you know sole props were generally excluded, uh, with the exception of the women-owned and minority-owned set aside. Um, we also had a problem with uh, new businesses that didn't have a period of March through September of last year to compare uh, that same period this year. So that was another gap. Um, and then there were people who fell just shy of the 50% loss, but were still suffering significantly. And those are the groups that we really want to um, try to address this go around. 
Um, you may have noticed that we were able to tweak along the way. We did end up including the S and C corps that have owner employees that issue W-2s. We allowed that to happen. So we had a lot more incoming on that side. And we've just announced last week the supplemental application for those most, um, you know, what we'll say is the travel and tourism and the event related space who, you know, reach the maximum grant uh, and to try to even out that distribution curve to those who have more employees than, than four, let's just say. And we expect with that supplemental application take up that we will expend all of the funds. So I don't know if you want me to go into more detail, I could open it up to, to Q&A or just, just let me know. I, I almost have too much information. <laughs> like I, I, I want to know kind of what's on the, I know that we heard from you throughout this process, different constituents who were left out or there were issues. I mean, obviously, it, it, you know, there were hiccups. I mean, it's not like everything went straight through um, and we're working through those issues now. I don't know what's happened to our chair, Jean. <laughs> Did I say something? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. I, Christy's trying to figure a way to get in. I guess Springfield's lost their internet. Oh, dear. I'm on the phone with Amy trying to figure it, but um, um, Jean, go ahead. And, and Thank you. Mike, Mike, so, Joan, thank you. Um, but you referred to a legislative report, and I can't find it. And also, oh. where is that? And, also, and, and what would be very helpful to the committee is data what what is the absolute i mean uh, 3000 people got money from ta tax and accd i don't know who they are what they are we need to know what it looks like now and what's happened in order to go forward so what how are we going to handle that with the committee okay let me um let me just find the report i know we sent it last week um and we could don't i just forwarded uh, amy the this week's report from 824. So okay, this okay. But will you okay. have a comprehensive? Will you have yes, a comprehensive I, report to date? Everything to date. Yes. So um, A to disco. Okay. I'm sending to Amy the uh, report that we sent last week, um, and. And I think if that's shared with the committee, we could um, we can go through that. It'll give you a good sense of it. Um, now, because it is a rolling application, obviously it's not going to be like as of right this moment. Um, but um, we have calculated that. Of the original 76 million uh, that ACCD was appropriated, that's a combination of both acts. Um, we have paid to date 33 million in total, and so it leaves us with a significant balance. Um, that balance will be utilized. Um, we have sent out supplemental applications, and tax has a demand of about. I think it's, a, uh, it's about $40 million worth of supplemental grants. So we will be utilizing that residual balance to help fund, um, to help fund that demand. Um, I, think, we, I think what is very helpful is to really get a profile of what those businesses are, what part of the sectors, that, what sectors of our economy are they in, so that we can fine tune the next move to help them, like we know hospitality is in deep trouble. Um, how right. do we deal with that? We also know from like I'll ask the same question at DOL because literally we're going to have thousands of, of uh, displaced, low skill, okay. low in you know low income employees who are out who we're also going to have to work with. So right. I think we need we need it's not just raw numbers; it's the profiles. And also, if there's some way of getting a real handle, and maybe it's from DOL on who those sole props are and what got, you know, where, where are they and the, where are they in the economy? Okay, so a couple of things. Um, on the sector breakdown, 
there is, um, and I'm referring to the report right now, if you want to go to page 11 of the report. Maybe we can bring see. it up. I haven't had a chance to post it yet. I'm in the process. OK. okay. Uh, is there a way for me to share screen? Yes, I can give there you is a way. one sec. That would be great. Okay, Joan, I just made you co-host, so now you can share. Uh-huh, okay, let's see. Uh, Down well, at the bottom, that share screen is green, I believe. Yeah, well, I think I'm gonna, there we go. I, believe, uh, I sent you just the update and Joan is sharing the total. Report. Yeah, there's a, so there was a comprehensive report due on uh, mid-August. There'll be another one due in October, I believe. And, and um, this was sent, I think it was sent last week, but here's the sector breakdown. Um, Thank you, Joan, that's perfect. And this is, you know, this is, actually, this is a better look at, oh, sorry. I'm trying to, I don't know how I get rid of the other screen, bear with me. So if, you take a look, I mean, obviously, it looks pretty well distributed amongst the sectors. Like when you look at, here in this one. Healthcare, social assistance, manufacturing, retail. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty healthy distribution. Um, you know, obviously there's, retail and restaurants, you know, food and accommodation services. This one is, it looks like it's, it's broken up a bit. Food is separate, listed separately. And accommodations is down here. Um, and we also, what we did is we looked at not only the sector distribution of the grant, but what the average loss was. So you will notice that accommodations had indeed the highest loss, but transportation was right up there with them and arts entertainment. I mean, there are no surprises really on this right-hand side. I'm not sure if you're, are you seeing that entire screen where we have that breakdown? The so that, that, was, that, per, that percentage is in the column, the sector percent. Okay, there we go. Uh, now I can see it. Sector employment is a percent of the state total. Yep, got oh, it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, we, it was clear that the initial early applicants were the people who suffered the most, the people who were closed at least one or two months. Um, that, that was absolutely clear from the applications that we processed. Let me just see what else we get. And, and Representative Sullivan, oh, Sullivan, I didn't know, there were other parts to your question, so I wanna make sure I'm answering them. We had data by sector. Oh, data the other by. part was, was is if as we go forward with the sole props, if we could get a picture of what that looks like, and oh. I'm, just, I'm hoping that maybe DOL from their PUA, I hate PUA, so those their PUA applications, we can get some sense of what what is that what does that look like? How does it break down? Well, there are tens of thousands. Uh, yeah. I know that we were able to get some information from Michael, but we have not. Uh, done a deeper dive uh, on that. So I, I couldn't really, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, we could go and get that. We just know that uh, at the get go, there were many sole props that were interested and ended up being denied unless they were in the category of women owned or minority owned. Yeah. Um, so we know that there's demand there. Now, um, BDCC and Two Rivers were able to do a sole proprietorship stabilization program through the CDBG funds, a small amount of money. Uh, they ended up uh, with, I think only about 300 applicants, which was interesting. And um, maybe it was because Burlington was not included in that first round, but they will, they are gearing up for a second round, uh, which, is, which is very, very helpful to the sole prop out there. Uh, this I thought was an interesting distribution to show the 
blue bar is the percent of grant recipients, the orange is the percent of grant dollars, and then the, um, the blue, the horizontal line bar chart is the business size contribution to state employment. And you could see that, you know, the largest percent really went to the smallest businesses. And, you know, I think that's by virtue of the $50,000 cap. You know, it really, those who are on the higher end in terms of, you know, numbers of employees really were the smaller percentages of the percent of grant dollars and percent of grant recipients. And that is both ACCD and tax. You know, we, we tried to aggregate where we could. Certain things were, uh, you know, kind of blown because we were the only ones who were focusing on sole proprietors out of the ACCD and tax. Tax did not uh, service the sole props. Um, what else is interesting here? Yeah, another, another cut at it in terms of firm size, applications, and dollar value. Um, it's sort of repetitive. Um, and here's the county distribution. Again, I don't think there were really any surprises. There was another county distribution that was interesting in terms of the numbers of businesses served in each of the counties uh, and the state employment share of that county. So um, Chittenden, the employment share is 33.06% and 30.9% uh, of the businesses served by the grants um, were served from Chittenden County. Not really many, again, not really many surprises. I mean, it looked like Lamoille was oversubscribed in a way, uh, which was interesting. That seemed to be the only kind of surprise. I'm going backwards, I don't know that by design. Uh, these are the total sum of subscribed awards by county. We're using subscribed because ACCD um, was making we are making payment files once a week. So there may be people that subscribed and we didn't get to or subscribed and weren't approved or were approved but not awarded just yet, so. And this is the total number of grants. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Jim. Matt, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Joan, I have a question. I, I just sent a text uh, that I got from a motel owner after the readjustment or recalibration of the increased uh, uh, grant money. Yeah. And if you'll take a look at that um, and what she says, and I wonder if, you know, particularly with motels, is there any room within your um, oversight to increase the amount of money that would go to hotels and motels, which have been substantially hurt far more than any other business? But if you could take yes, a look at that text. Yes, what we're going to do, and like last week, we announced what we're calling the supplemental award, mm -hmm. and that is prim primarily for hospitality. So indeed, they will have, it's for people who reach the maximum, the 50,000, they right. will be able to apply for more. Um, and we did it in specific sectors for that very reason. It became clear that not every sector was suffering as great as the um, travel and tourism related sectors. Okay, well, if you could just take a, uh, 30 seconds and go and look at the uh, message that I, of the copy that I, uh, from um, my constituent and okay. uh, just take a look at it. And you sent it to me in an email or something? I, I, I sent it to everyone um, via the chat okay. here. Oh, okay. Joan, you'll probably wanna stop screen sharing or maybe you can see it without it showing up. Okay. Um, 
do you want me to address this right right now or do you want to go through the rest of the report um time is of the essence So why don't we just get through the report, and then we can start. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Start um, asking so, questions after. Mm -hmm. um, this was a breakdown of the number of awards by the funding source, so that you're able to see, you know, most of these were the 75% or greater loss, um, and then 50%, and then we had these separate set asides uh, from H966. And then this is expressed by dollar amount rather than number of award. And this was for tax department and that's also very kind of sim similar story. Most were in the 75% or greater loss category. So, I mean, that's, Kind of the report. I don't know if um, did I answer your questions, um, Representative O'Sullivan. I know that you were mentioning yes. the salt props, so so we'll need to find out who they are. Um, the salt props that we served already are all embedded within these data points that we divided by sector. Um, so it, it's across the board, you know. Oh, you they did. Were, yeah. It's this 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 is exactly what I wanted to look at. Okay, great. Thanks. You're welcome. What else should should I cover, um, Chairman Marcotte? Charlie, I believe, was next with a question. Um, is every does ever, anyone have any questions on what Joan just gave us before we ask her to take it off screen? <laughs> take it away. Um, Amy, I'm not sure how to do that <laughs> on, on Zoom. How to unshare? Yeah, how do I, how am I doing that? Is that? Go back down to the share screen and uh, uh, I think you can just, or hmm. maybe not, maybe it's on the upper. Uh, oh, okay. I can stop for you. You can stop it, right? Okay. There All right, go. great. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right, we're all back. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Joan, just a couple of questions. I know you and I confirmed that the women and women owned businesses, that fund was fully expended. Um, and I don't know about the minority owned businesses. Can you give us an idea of how many applicants were for each of those programs, if you know, and uh, were there a lot of people left on the sidelines or applicants that didn't get funding uh, from that? Yeah, so I am. Um... There are 48 applications, uh, women that we approved but ran out of money for. So we are uh, working to figure out a solution to that. There were others that came in after the fact that we ended up denying. In total, from all of the applications that we've taken in, we've got a little over 100 denials, a little bit over 100 ineligibles, and they're dispersed in there. So unfortunately, I can't talk too much about the oversubscribed list other than the 48 that we know. Um, I mean, we, we could get it. It just, it would take some work to go into each, each and every application. Um, and I believe we have some data. Just give me a minute to get those details on the numbers so far. Yes, um, as, as you're going through that, the, the minority-owned businesses is also fully subscribed or not No, minority-owned is not fully subscribed. Um, okay. We have room there. Okay. The way H966 was written is that as of September 1st, if there's residual there, we could, we merge the pools. Um, so we will see next Tuesday what, what will happen there. Um, so let's just say. I think, Dylan, while you're grabbing that, uh, I think it's worth noting we had to make some decisions about that set aside and how to deal with it. And the $5 million set aside was one of the trickier elements of our 
uh, yeah. building out the system. Uh, and we made the determination that we were going to use those set asides only for women and minority owned businesses with zero employees. Because otherwise, those applicants could be funded through our normal application. And so to date, about 40% of our applications have been women owned businesses. Yeah. 5% of our applications have been minority owned businesses. And all of those aren't captured in the $5 million set aside. The only ones captured in the $5 million set aside are those businesses with no employees. Got it. Yeah, that's an important note. Um, again, as per legislation, the set aside was meant for the zero to five, but we thought the one to five would get funded from our normal pot anyway. So in total, the women business enterprises funded 622 of them and 388 of that number were sole props. Um, on the minority owned, we've got 154 minority owned and I don't have the breakdown yet on the sole prop. I think it's a, yeah, I don't have that breakdown. Oh. Okay. And then um, as we're looking at, I think you said with the supplemental grants that were made available last week, you expect the any remaining balances in both the ACCD and tax department pots of money from 350 and H966, those will be fully expended by that, you, you believe? Yes, we just went over that this morning. Um, there is significant interest in the supplemental, as one could imagine, from the hospitality uh, industry, and so we will um, we will fully expend it. I mean, maybe there's going to be a million dollars left, at, you know, but from what we could see so far from the applications that have come in through tax, um, yeah, they would definitely spend down this residual. Oh, uh, there was a question about who the people are. Just to be clear, in the report, we do hyperlink to the list of grant recipients on our site. So each and every grant recipient is public information, uh, just the name of the entity and the dollar amount that they received. And I, I did have a, a question. I don't know if it's appropriate here, Mr. Chair, or not, but really about the duplication of benefits that is now on the ACCD site, too. Is, it, is that all right? Or should we hold that for later? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I think it was added to the website maybe last week in terms of a calculator to look at a duplication of benefits as to what you would be potentially liable for in a grant if you had already received other funds from either PPP or maybe an idle grant, or if your losses were not as great as the amount of the grant that you received. So in looking at the language that's there, it's possible that someone could receive a have received a grant that is greater than the loss that they actually incurred for the one month or the two months, you know, if they have a seasonally slow business in March and April, maybe, something like that. So they could be liable to repay that money. That's how I read it. I was wondering mm -hmm. if that's how you interpreted it or if that's how it's meant. So it's meant as a warning because this is a crisis that hasn't ended yet. So it's unlike other disasters where you have a loss and you, it's very discreet, like you know precisely what that loss is. And so for many people that's still unfolding. However, we feel that it's important for us to warn folks that there is a possibility of duplication of benefit if you are getting funding that ends up being more than what your loss is. And that is the warning. And yeah, there there could be ramifications of being of having to pay it back. You know, and some businesses are concerned about it. And that as a result, we've given an opportunity on the supplemental application, particularly, to, for them to indicate a lesser amount than the full 100 additional that they could be entitled to based on whatever their revenue figure is. So um, we felt it was incumbent upon us to put sufficient warning there. You know, it's a, it's hard at any. We, we cannot tell right now if there's a duplication of benefit because again, we don't know when this crisis will be over. We don't know, we can't foresee the future. You know, other states have done things like done projections, but you'd have to then go back and see 
you know, kind of a truing up. Um, you know, we keep using December 30th as if everything's going to end on December 30th. What if this continues into next year, you know? So it's, it's a tricky, it, it is tricky, but we think that the calculator may help and the warnings may help um, folks to, um, you know, to be, to be prudent about it and to save all, all receipts and, and everything. Yeah, I, my only concern is that some of the businesses may not have anticipated that when they applied for the grant. Um, that if they received a grant that was equal to 10% of the revenues from 2019, it might actually exceed the loss that they experienced in April or March. Well, and we so did have duplication of benefit warning on the first application. We did not, um, we just expanded on it uh, recently because of the supplemental, but we did have that. There was an attestation and a warning on the first application. I believe it was in our FAQ. You know, there was a, um, you know, there's definitely mention of it because we felt like we had to. Um, yeah, it's, I'm just wondering how many people read that. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a grant. No, I, I, I understand. I, I totally yeah. get it. I, I think that determination was, you know, there was a lot of discussion about do we subtract out what they received and right. then we came to determination well how could we because we don't know if that's a good way to do that and it would that really be helpful to the businesses so a lot of considerations that we thought well let's just warn folks that you know that if if there's a duplication of benefit you you may have to return some of it okay thank you Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I have been double booked and it looks like I'm due over in the Senate right now. So I'm going to leave you with Joan if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. That's that's fine, Ted. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you joining us and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Thank you. Anything else, Charlie? Stephanie? Thanks. Uh, Jonah, I have a couple of questions about clarification. So um, from the, uh, the women-owned businesses, uh, it, did I understand it correctly that if a, if a woman-owned business had an employee, it was not, they, they did not receive a grant out of that, out of that sole proprietor, and they were sole proprietor, they didn't receive the, out of that pool, or were they, is that right? Yeah, so in other, in other words, if you, if you had a W-2 employee, whether it was yourself or somebody else, you were going to be funded you know, from our general pool. From the general pool, I see. Yeah, and we did that just to reserve space for the sole prop since this was the only avenue for them to get funding when we started this whole journey. Okay, um, all right, so that, okay, that's good clarification. And then the, um, with this remaining money, are you considering, are you gonna put all that money towards a supplemental grant or are you indeed gonna look at businesses who've had a uh, loss less than 50%. In my community, I have these, in, like, you know, in Brandon, we've had years of, of road construction. So people have, have had significant losses for years. I've had a few businesses that have come to me and said, you know, Stephanie, I've, I received a 47%. I had a 47% loss. Right. So I, if, if I was to look at my income, they were looking to look at their income like three years ago, it would have been a sig you know, much larger loss, but because they're, they're, they already lost so much money because of, um, road construction. So are you going to look at that like less than 50%? So, yeah, all we're able to do, um, the only leeway we were able to do without legislative was the design of the program. We could not touch the less than 50% because it's in statute. So, so we thought, let's make sure we're helping those that we can within our purview. And then if the legislature decides to change it, that's what we're asking for is the people who are 30 to 50% loss, okay. that would be, you know, we need additional money for that. And also new businesses were excluded. Right. So we want to accommodate that. Um, what am I missing? Sole proprietors. And sole props, right. Yeah, so whatever, whoever was left out was, all right, let's let's serve, so serve you, them. You will, you, so I get my, what I guess what I want to clarify is that, so you're not going to use all the remaining money for the supplemental grants. You're gonna to try to keep some funds so that you can serve these other community of businesses. These other businesses. No, no, we're gonna use, we wanna use all the funds for the supplemental and that, so because we have the ability to do that like right here, right now, 
um, the ask of the legislature is to change the statute to allow for those three, but we're not going to hold up the money until that happens. They want to use the the, the remaining Correct. Uh, CRF funds. That, Correct. that This is part of the governor's proposal. Okay, so I guess, yes. I guess I'm concerned about how, if we're going to use all those funds up, how we're going to help these other uh, sole props, the less than 50% and the new owners. There's an additional ask. So that's, so we're going to have an additional ask, okay. right, for additional CRF money okay. and change the statute to uh, allow for those, those situations. Okay, thanks for the clarification. And then one last question. Right. When we set this up and and uh, pass the legislation, I was convinced this money was gonna fly out the door. And I was, I'm, I'm frankly shocked that we have anything left over. So I just wanted your comment on why, why do you think this, this money hasn't, hasn't uh, gone out as fast as in, anticipated or the fact that you still have remaining funds? Um, I, I have my own a few ideas just from, but I, I'm sure just like everybody else in the room, we have been working really hard and encouraging every single business we know. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Well, I think we had a cap. I think if you look at the graphs really well, you'll see that the distribution is really skewed towards small businesses. And small businesses, because this was based on revenue, spent less, you know, we spent, we expended less because it, you know, each, each individual grant is for less. The fact that we're going to be able to spend all of it down with the supplemental kind of tells us that maybe our cap was too small, right? The 50K might have been too small. But we erred on the side of conservatism because we'd much rather be prudent and have some leftover money to then help whoever has not been helped, right? Rather than being like, okay, have the cap start out at 100. So, yeah, you know, I think that was a criticism from day one. Like somebody wrote to us and said, what are you doing? Like 50K is so small. But we had no way of knowing demand, right? That was one thing. Yeah. Uh, the idea that this will be spent down is, be, is definitely um, reinforces the fact that the severely injured sectors are severely injured and we need to help them. And that's hospitality, travel and tourism related, entertainment, arts, all, all of that. And that's what's gonna eat up the rest of the funds and that's rightly so, right? And the others might've been closed a month or two months but then came back to business. Yeah. I'm not minimizing the, the challenges. I mean, they're, it's still hard and it might still be reduced, but a lot of sectors went back and we were able to see that when they went back, you know, it was, I don't want to say business as usual, but right. you know, not quite the same scenario as operating within reduced capacity. Right. So I was just looking at, so if you look, if we look at the numbers of businesses and the size of the businesses in the state, I think, what's happened is probably is correct. Like we do have this giant number of very small businesses. And, and so, and, and perhaps for those very small businesses, 10% of your gross and your gross is $500,000, you know, that, that does perhaps have a, a, a big help. But I, I do understand that the, all the bigger businesses are, it is tough. Um, yeah. But I guess I, I was just wondering about the application. Was there, a, was a, was a, was, is there a feeling that you received the amount so the amount of applications you felt like you were going to receive or did you feel like there was other marketing that could have been done or should have been done or, or how do we convince people that this is a good idea? I mean, I was still having conversations with people last week that they were saying, oh, I don't know if I, if I qualify. And I said, well, you can't, you don't know if you're qualified unless you open the application. Right. You know, no, it's true. I think, I think some people are reluctant and we're still getting applications. Like there are, there is still a trickle of applications coming in each and every day. Okay. So some people didn't have a loss right away. Maybe March isn't typically their big month or April isn't their big month. And then we saw an uptick at the end of July and maybe we'll see another uptick at the end of August, right? Because the, the summer might've been slower than they, than they thought. I mean, it's like anything else. Like I thought the sole prop stabilization program that was a lottery that, that BDCC did, I thought that was going to be thousands and 300. Now, some people just don't want to apply for grants. Like it's just too much trouble or I, I don't know. I can't, I don't want to speak for them. I, 
you know, I, what I do want to say though, is even though it feels like it was less, it was still enormous. Like it was hundred, at one point they were like 700 applications in queue. I thought we'd never get through it. Right. right. So it was, yeah, it, it, it was a lot. And, and yeah, and there was work involved. People had to upload financials and, you know, there, there's some work involved and, well, and, and maybe. And you needed to have your books in order. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, thanks. Okay, uh, the member formerly known as Representative Ralph, Representative Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hey, Joan, nice to see you again. Um, can you all hear me okay? All right. Cool. Sure. Um, I, so actually, um, Stephanie just asked the question that I was, was asking was, you know, <laughs> when we left, left the session, um, it felt like there was a lot of unknowns, you know, what how is this going to go? And do we have enough money? Are we giving it to the right people? And and sort of this pressure to get the door out really uh, the money out the door really quickly. And so I yes, I was also surprised to see that um, that we still have funds in the bank, which I guess in some ways is a it's a good thing. And I think that gives us opportunities to um, adjust. And um, and so I I have a broader question of. Um, it was really about what lessons we learned to to get this. Uh, to get this money in the right places, and it and it um, and it sounds like you were saying, you know, we need to give more money to specific sectors, and that in, that in, it, I'm sorry. So my question is, were, were you, are you suggesting that we are that we are increasing the cap for specific sectors or all across the board? It's a specific ones um, because of the limited constraints. You know the. The constraints that they still face in terms of limited occupancy and um, yeah, close, you know, and really. Do you, do you have an idea of, of uh, so are we going to use based on the chart that you shared with us earlier those sectors that were hardest hit? Um, you know, it looked like retail had the highest percentage of need, um, which I guess I was. I guess I'm not that surprised about, but I thought the food and the service sector would be a little bit higher. Um, so you're, uh, do you have that list of sectors that we would want to increase the cap on? Is that in any of the? It's proposals? in the supplemental. Um, it's not in the proposal to the legislature. It's what we announced last week for um, travel and tourism related. So retail, uh, hospitality, arts, recreation, sports, you know, that those are the NAICS codes that um, the supplemental will go to and tax pretty much has the lion's share of those because of the retail and restaurants and hospitality. Okay, I will, uh, I'll find that and look at those. Thank okay. you. The, uh, the last question I had was, do you have, an indi do you have any indication about whether, the, whether we're actually helping the, the businesses that are receiving these funds um, that this is actually helping them? The only thing I can go is on the anecdotals. I mean, there are people who have come in and said that they were able to pay down like all these things that were accumulating uh, and it gives them a level of hope to reopen. And they're still very, very nervous about their you know, 50% capacity, but that's all I can go on because we have not had a minute to do anything other than this. So um, I, I couldn't answer it. I mean, maybe the proof is next year if we still have a, hospitality industry, then we'll know that we've done good. Um, you know, yeah, it's yeah. going to be, you know, it's, there's fall ahead of us and winter and, you know, yeah, I, I think we have to help them through, through that, through that time, which is not going to be like last year. So you still don't have a crystal ball is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, hard, hard to say, but you know, it, it runs across the gamut. Like there were larger businesses who might have thought the 50k is not enough, but they took it, right? Because it's 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 money that could pay a bill. Um, and there are small businesses that got as little as a thousand dollars and were forever grateful. So it's it's a combination. It, it maybe it's an economic development grant, but maybe it's really assistance. It's just financial assistance. Thank you. you know, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Goldstein, um, if you'll take a look at that text that I sent you. Um, okay. The analogy that, pardon me. 
Okay. Um, that was from a constituent and the analogy that she provides um, is that, you know, restaurants uh, were eligible for the same amount of grant money that an inn owner um, was uh, um, um, subject to or available to. However, um, restaurants were able to open up and at reduced capacity um, and take takeout orders. And for motel, hotel and inn owners, they weren't. So my direct question to you is that in the recalibration of uh, grant monies, have you given any thought to uh, hotel, motel and, and inn owners um, to boost the amount of money? Because they have been, in, in the inn and hotel owners that I've spoken to have just been decimated. So I'm looking at the chat. Um, I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. So it sounds like they don't want the grant to be based on 10%. Is that, I think that's, that's what it looks like. Okay. Um, so no, I mean, to answer you shortly, no, we have not thought about another methodology because we've gone so far with this one, but yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't I don't know. I Is mean I guess they're basically I mean they're basically the, saying sorry. I guess they're comparing themselves to another business and saying why is it fair that they're down more and so we did not base this on how much somebody is down, but is rather it your purview? Uh, yeah. Uh yeah, we could we could change methodology. Sure. We could. That's good to hear. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Joan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to go back over the women minority. I think you said 45% of the women were funded, or it sounded like the women, which looks like they got like 2.5 million. Um, you you ran out of money with them. There's a lot more yes. women. And then the minority was 1.898. Now, did you run out of money with them as well? Or it was a much- No, percentage? no, not yet. We, we still have more money in the minority owned. And what did you say that percentage was for the minority? Um, a much smaller percent. Was it 45 for women and- Percent of- What you funded, I don't know, whatever I you- I think oh, Ted, um, said, Ted had said that 40% of all applicants were uh, women-owned women. businesses of all, and then 5% were minority-owned businesses. Minority. I think that's what he said, across all of the programs. Okay. But the actual dollars amount are, it sounds like they're more of two to one instead of by that larger percentage. But anyway, um, but you still have now, when you have money left over on the minority, does that mean you're going to be able to use that for both groups or just another group or? It sounds like as of September 1st, we're able to use it for both groups. Okay, so you could fund more of the women. Correct. Then from that, okay. The second question I have really has to do with, you talk about the $50,000 cap, but there are, and I know I've talked to the chair about this, there are some larger businesses in the hospitality industry, for instance, like the ski areas and maybe some others, where the cap, there was another cap of 20 million as far as their gross or something, Yes. Uh, and that would be a, a detriment to people who actually gross more than 20 million. I mean, uh, any of the scariest, I mean, lots of different kinds yeah. of, businesses. I mean, what, and so they were sort of like locked out of this one piece is this. Yeah. So what on the supplemental stuff are we going to do for them? I mean, because, you know, yeah. I've, been around, I've been around Jay Peak a lot this summer and they were like a ghost town. They're a little better now, but right. um, they're all, you know, I hear Stowe is just loaded with out of state people and, um, but yeah. other places aren't. And even if they do have it, it's not the same thing. Yeah, we are talking about that. I mean, we don't have it in a full on proposal yet, but we are talking about the some of the hospitality properties that are over that 20 million and what to do about them. We are having conversations. We've not resolved anything just yet. Um, but I think initially we use that as a revenue cap um, 
to define small businesses because we felt within the confines of CRF, it was permissible to help small businesses and that not that everybody over 20 million is not small, but we had to do some some guideline, but we are we are talking about we're aware of the problems in some of the uh, ski areas. Yeah, or some Jay, Jay specifically. Yeah. Or some big hotels. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Christy, glad to see you get your internet back. So all that bragging I did about earlier in the year about our local provider and it's the, it crashed when we were on the floor session. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come back. I, I changed locations thinking it was my uh, the, my home uh, internet. It wasn't. I came down to my place of employment. Uh, it came back on briefly, but then it crashed again. So, uh, but I'm back up. So I'm here. Uh, so, excuse me if this question has been asked already. I, I missed out on the early conversations. Uh, and I apologize for that. So, Joan, thank you for the efforts and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, certainly uh, for what the ACCD and, and the tax are doing. Uh, we're, getting some, uh, we're getting some positive comments. Uh, some of the negatives or the, the fall through the crack loopholes, um, and, and I thought these were covered, but apparently they're not. And that's the Chamber of Commerce uh, organizations that uh, rely on the events that were not allowed to take place. And I know there was some discussion early on about uh, uh, projected income as actual income and uh, it's hard to do hard to do the projection income but nonetheless um, we're, are they eligible for any type of support and in my second question is um, it has to do with a local farmer that uh, uh, acts as a distributor to local restaurants and event um, venues uh, and of course with the event venue collapsing such as the weddings and other types of gigs um, their their loss of revenue is uh, is extreme, and, and I'm a little confused about if if and where they these two groups would uh, be eligible to apply for. Sure, um, thanks for the question. Uh, they are both eligible for our grant program. In fact, we funded quite a few chambers of commerce, um, so I would urge them to apply. Um, the same thing with the event venues, uh, we had plenty of those applications. So basically anybody who could not um, file an application with tax came to ACCD. Um, so I would urge them to apply. If they applied and had some difficulty, then we have our helpline. If they just have their application number, we could help them through it. But the, you know, the nonprofits, the chambers included, uh, we took our cue from the um, legislation that was written about the Arts Council in terms of calculation of revenue. We didn't include all grants and um, grants and donations. We stuck to program service revenue, which caused some difficulty, I know, and consternation amongst uh, nonprofits and particularly chambers. But uh, we we did an awful lot of work to decipher the. The revenue streams to determine, you know, yeah, indeed they are suffering because of COVID-related lack of events. So, um, yeah, we we took a lot of care and feeding and also critique, but we are um, we are processing them. Thank you, and and that's as I remember it. But and maybe it's uh, maybe it's an issue with the local chamber and their application process. So I will follow up with that. But the the second one is the the local crop grower, farmer that raises crops, that uh, distributes or sells food to the uh, event venues that were canceled. So he's not really hosting the events himself, but he's a provider of the, uh, the a lot of the food that goes into those events. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and uh, he was struggling also to, to find a match or where he actually fit in. Yeah, I think that, you know, we got lots of applications from all kinds of sectors and even like agriculture has a program, <clears throat> um, dairy and non-dairy and, um, but, but it's okay, even if they apply to us, we typically check with some of the other agencies to find out whether or not they sent in an application. So even if they're confused about where to apply, tell them to come to our site and it kind of takes them through the, the sort of you know, there's so, so many grant programs um, that the state has now, and I understand how that could be confusing, but 
if they come in and, and try to do one, at least through us, we could um, we could take a look at it. Okay, thanks, Randy. Yeah, we basically didn't turn anybody away saying, no, you belong to go to this program. We yeah. basically were like, we would process it. And then what we'll do is share that information with other agencies. So there isn't duplication. Excellent. Um, I think some of the confusion may have been on my part because of the information they were kicking back to me that uh, uh, they didn't qualify, but that may have been from a lack of uh, understanding on their part. But I tried to get them the information and uh, I did mention ACCD. So thank you for that information and I'll reconnect with them. Okay. Uh, before I go to Charlie, Joan, could you just get a little, go a little deeper into the nonprofit sector and which our chambers are part of that too, but how I, I think what, what we had looked at um, and the language we put in for the art council um, really dealt with straight donations, anything that is um, tax deductible, it would not be counted. But um, I've heard some um, that I've been told that, that like their dues is can't be counted. Um, any of the fundraisers that they do year after year is not counted. Is is that how you all are looking at that or? Uh, no, I think it was program service revenue, but where we got, where, where it got um, kind of sidetracked was uh, the the way certain organizations keep track or account for their revenue um so for example their membership dues may not have been impacted at all right and then in some cases if the nonprofit actually operates a gym it would be right so there had to be a little bit more analysis on the types of revenues um and we because the arts council going to be treated that way we thought all right well we ought to treat all nonprofits that way because it, then it wouldn't seem fair. So yeah, it, that caused a, a, a great big stir, not just from the applicants, but even the reviewers, because it took a lot more to delve into those right. applications and understand it. Okay. Just so everybody knows if they hear any pounding or anything going on in the background, it's probably coming from me. They're working on my putting a new roof on my house. So um, just bear with me. I'll try to mute as much <laughs> as I can. Uh, Charlie, we said you were going to raise the roof, Mike. So that's I didn't I raise it though. No, all right. I'm just covering uh, it again. No, I, I had questions in a couple different uh, areas, not specific to grants. And uh, one is that I just want to talk to you about the restart Vermont Business Assistance Program, and then the second, uh, right? The and then the second is really looking at long-term recovery. A lot of the businesses that we're talking about, the larger ones, even 150,000 isn't going to do it. Um, it's really reopening uh, for visitors to come and increasing the occupancy rates. So uh, other states have been successful in, say, the Cape uh, or New Hampshire and Maine in, in changing the occupancy requirements where those facilities have been able to maintain um, all the health standards and abide by those and increase their occupancy rates. and. So I've been talking to a local resort and they have also expressed great concern about losing the fall, losing the fall season. So I'm, I'm asking this question as to how can we look at adjusting that? I know we're trying to base it on science where other states have been able to safely open. Are they using a different science? So how, how can we get to that? Yeah, I am not sure if I could offer any encouraging words to kind of estimate what it would take to get to that. I just could just state what we've done on our, our record of containing containing the virus. I mean, I yeah, we we differed quite a bit from many other neighboring states, as we all know. And uh, we've been more strict, let's say, but we can't say that's had a negative outcome. Um, and we understand that that's not positive for this entire group and this entire industry. Um, you know, I, I think, and you'll see that in the ask from the administration is to get another $50 million for I think it's 50, it might have changed, but uh, you know, tens of millions to continue to help 
this industry stay in place. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I can't say why we're not doing it the way Massachusetts is doing. Many, many places opened up quicker and many places had to retract. So I, yeah, I, I don't have an encouraging word about when that's going to happen. Fair enough. Um, and the other is just on the restart from our business program, you know, the assistance oh. to businesses and uh, it was a two and a half million dollar allocation to put out an RFPs for someone to step up and provide businesses with that kind of assistance and point to our different experts. Um, do you know where that may be at this point? Yeah, in fact, I went on vacation last week. I took a couple of days and uh, right before I left, I know that we were making decisions on it. So I just don't know whether we've fully announced that yet, but we had a fair amount of interest in it. I think we were oversubscribed. Um, and I think there's a way that we could divvy it up and make sure we have the entire state coverage uh, for this important program. You know, we, we put out an RFP probably the beginning of August, or maybe it was just the tail end of July, uh, applications came in. We were looking for good ideas on what people could do. And we had a variety, some focused on specific sectors, others did more statewide uh, distribution of services. Some will hire expertise, you know, the, there's a variety of good ideas. So I think that we will have it covered. I just have not checked in to find out where are we in terms of notifying the um, the the bidders and the um, coming up with the actual announcement and developing the program. Thanks, look forward to that. This was the technical assistance, right? Make sure we're yeah. talking about the same thing. I know we called right. it restart right. and everything, but. A lot of things, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I saw Mike, I, you're muted, but I saw you say Zach, so got that. Um, Joan, uh, this actually goes back to Mike's question about the nonprofit sector. Um, I did um, did hear some comments from folks that this is um, just, I, I don't know if you all had addressed this, but um, they, when I talked to them about why they were ultimately denied, why uh, charitable donations were not accepted, they understood that, um, but they were, um, still frustrated that they went through the process and were denied. Um, and so what I had heard from them, which might be helpful, is that if it's clearly marked somewhere, and maybe it is, um, that charitable, you know, you, charitable donations don't count as lost revenue, just so they can avoid the whole process. Um, I was talking to somebody I knew pretty well, and he was pretty upset, uh, <laughs> knowing full well that I was part of um, creating some of this the language around the bill. Um, so I, I think uh, just if you haven't done it already, just something that clearly says. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we describe it on the site, but um, just to be clear, they're not going to be denied for including it. We would just send it back to them to tell them to exclude it in their calculation. So I don't know if that ended up happening, but if not, you know, please let me know, give me the application number and we'll look into it. No, it, I, they, they, I, the, you guys were great with them and, and the person did refill out the application and, and I don't, I have no yeah. idea what happened after that, but th thanks. Yeah. Jeremy. Yeah. We, um, just so that everyone's aware, we, we had a, um, we had a system where if you didn't do all the right stuff, we were able to bounce it back to the applicant to continue to upload and, and make adjustments. So that's unlike any other grant program, typically you apply and that's it. So we did give people several opportunities and we understand that, especially for smaller businesses, it's hard for them to get all their P&Ls in order. And so there was a mechanism for that. Was, um, so the other, yeah, as you're saying this, I'm reminded, there was also a um, frustration that, that their application was gonna get uh, kicked to the back of the line because they didn't have all their proper documentation in the first time. Do you know if um, their spot in the line was reserved or if, um, if they didn't have everything, they kind of got kicked to the end of the line? At this point, it looks like there's still money left, so. Um. Yeah, they, so what would happen is um, it, they didn't get kicked to the end of the line. What would happen is they come back in and their original date and timestamp puts them in order of being reviewed first. So they'd come back in, they'd have to be reviewed but they'd be first in line to be reviewed if they're above all the others, right? In terms of date stamp. 
And then same thing with the approval queue that I would look at the approval queue. I see some applications in there that would be from July. I'm looking at them first and approving them before I approve the August ones. Okay, cool. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of questions, Joan, on, again, back to the women owned businesses, the grants. Um, I received a, an email over the weekend from um, representative back in St. Johnsbury that had a, a woman owned business. Um, she was a, actually a W-2 um, corporation. Um, but she, would do they automatically get moved into the other grant program once we decided we were going to accept them? Because um, it didn't sound like anybody either the business or, or Representative Beck wasn't aware of that. Um, so how, how was that? Any of yeah, those? So, yeah, so people who had been either incomplete or denied or ineligible, uh, when we made the change to go to allow the W-2 owner employee, we contacted all those people that were in that category. Now, if did this person fall through the cracks? If they did, then send me the application number and we'll look into it and make sure that that gets funded because it should have been. Yeah, we thought once we did that, we didn't have to take it from the women owned sole prop. We would just take it from the general prop, which we had much more money. Right. Um, and when we, so if we have money left over, um, if the minority owned businesses don't use up their allowed, allotted amount of money, is it the thought after September 1st that we're going to look at the 48 applications that are now outstanding that said they would be funded yeah. and then apply that money to them? Yes. Now, does it look like there's enough, there'll be enough money in there to take care of those 48? As of right now, it does look like that. Um, but we have about 70 applications in queue. So I don't, I don't know. Okay. But we've got but, 48 that, that received a letter saying they were they were going to be funded Correct. and um, by hook or by crook, yeah. Yeah. So I so that. it looks like right now there's enough money there at least to take care of that group of people that we you know that were told they were going to get money. Okay. Great. Okay. Because uh, I've had some um, conversations with other legislators, um, you know, who have people that were kind of upset that yes we they were told they were going to get money. And then three or four weeks later, they got another yes. letter saying, whoops, um, we're out of money. So I'll yeah. let that, so that, that's good. Um, I'll let them know that, that they're still in the queue and that they're, um, if my, when money becomes available, they'll be getting it. We did let folks know, those 48 know that their application, we called it on hold because we didn't want to deny and we didn't want to just say, we said, you know, unfortunately, we ran out of money and, you know, faux pas, it's our, you know, our error for doing that. Um, but we do feel that we some way or another, we're going to get funding to get those funded just because it is the right thing to do. Okay, great. Any other questions for Joan? Okay. Is that a comment, if I may? Is we uh, we've all encountered constituents, of course, that have unique situations. I didn't know it was possible to have a nonprofit corporation without employees until now, uh, and then also have things like LLCs with no employees, but that's how they run their inn or their bed and breakfast, uh, and several other iterations of those types of things. Where um, beforehand, it would, I would assume that some of those nonprofit corporations would have employees because they get, you know, they pay. Um, so I know that that's part of your proposal and looking at shoring up that stuff in the second, but it was a surprise, I think, for all of us in the different situations we encountered in between the time the program was announced and now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want nonprofits with no employees to get funded, please be explicit. That's my plea. <laughs> Any other questions for Joan? Ted, glad you could join us back again. Thank you. Um, did you want to just kind of go over the program? Um, I just saw that um, we 
just received the language from Jess and I've just asked, sent that off to David asking him to uh, please draft. Um, so we'll be looking at that as soon as, uh, as soon as David can complete that. But maybe you, I know um, we are going to be joining approach at 1.30 and, and probably um, maybe going further in depth with what you're going to tell us. But I think if you can just give us an overall um, you know, a high level view. So that uh, I just, I'm afraid, I don't want to get too deep into it until we get to a probe. So we're not duplicating, um, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting there already hearing all of this and, and we have to wait for probes to catch up. I, I just assume that we all get catch up at the same time. All right. Well, let me start with, uh, can I share my screen? Would that be all right? Just uh, I'll, I'll share sure. one document. Yeah. Okay, Amy, if you can make Ted a co-host. Well, I'm waiting on that. So I'd like to run through just the generic overarching proposals that we have, and we won't go into any detail because you'll get that this afternoon, and then talk specifically about the $23 million that we're asking for uh, to expand the economic recovery grant program that we've just been spending uh, time talking about. Still don't have host screening ability, Amy. So when you- uh, when Amy you stepped have, away, may have stepped away from her computer. So the big, the big thing we'll talk about today is the $133 million ask that uh, the administration that we are asking for. Uh, we have identified those areas where we uh, made uh, misjudgments on what resources we need, we've realized there are some things that need to be changed, but then we also have some things that were inadequately funded in uh, earlier in the summer, and we're coming back with uh, a better uh, idea of where we need additional money. So that 133 million includes four major areas. One is $23 million to do uh, economic recovery grants. Same program we've all run, but we need to change the program a bit to cover some of these little one-offs we've been talking about that we didn't uh, think about. Uh, two is $50 million for the hospitality sector. We know, we built this system with the assumption that our grant was meant to cover several months, a couple of months of fixed costs, right? Well, that was when we thought the COVID crisis might last several months, not a year. And so when we look at our travel policies and we look at the hospitality sector, we have realized we need to do another round, not a supplemental, not just increase the grant for the larger ones. We're talking another round so that every hospitality industry that can prove a loss has access to additional dollars. We estimate that to be about a $50 million nut that we need to crack. <clears throat> uh, we're also recognizing that this crisis has drastically changed the way we all live. And though we all like to think we'll go back to the way we lived before this, I think many of us won't unless we're asked to. And so we have a $50 million proposal to get people to participate in the stimulus of our economy. And this is through uh, a direct payment to each household that is in the form of a credit at a business, a Vermont business. And what's really neat about this proposal, we talked about this in the uh, early summer, we have, we're going to have within a couple of weeks, a pilot fully underway that can demonstrate how this will work. And it will be very tangible for you all to evaluate. But it comes down to getting uh, every, the equivalent of $150 to every household in Vermont that they would spend at a Vermont business. It shows up in a really neat credit to a Vermont business, has algorithms that make sure that the money gets spread around the state, is geographically spread, has algorithms to make sure that everyone doesn't go and buy darn tough socks at Charlie's store. They might actually go to Lenny's and other stores as well. So it has these algorithms that make sure that the stimulus is spread across multiple businesses. And really neat, it has algorithms in it that encourage people to try new things. So that's a $50 million ask. And then when the time's right, uh, we need to launch a marketing program like nobody has seen before. 
just like our consumer habits are changing and you and I are buying things online more often, uh, we're uh, going out to eat less. Uh, you know, Southern New England, the Middle Atlantic, their habits are gonna change too. And we're at a real disadvantage to losing market share because once people stop doing something, it's like they've never done it and they can pick something new. Somebody that used to come skiing in Vermont every winter might go skiing in New Hampshire this year because the regulations might be different. And if we don't do a marketing campaign, we'll never get that consumer back and we'll lose uh, market share in the ski industry, in the hospitality industry, in the leaf peeping industry, uh, in, you keep going down the list. So Ted, the, uh, Ted yeah. you, can, you can share your screen now, Amy, uh, got you all set up. Thank you, thank you. One moment while I do so. So what we just ran through, if you can see, and I'll blow it up a little bit, uh, we just ran through this box that's a middle of the screen called CRF one times 133 million. So we're asking for 133 million for these four uh, components. I wanted to do that overview because the most important one for us is this business grant program, this 23 million. That lang legislative language that Jess delivered today to you does three critical things in the emergency recovery grant program. Number one, it allows us to make grants to sole proprietors of any race and any gender. Uh, we have a specific ask. I think we're starting at $5 million for sole proprietors. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, it allows us to help new businesses. When, you know, when we all drafted this legislation together, uh, we put in restrictions that required you to demonstrate loss from last year to this year. Well, if you're a new business that started in March, your revenue likely was lower in March of 19 than it was in March of 20, not because you had a bad 19, but because as a new business, you simply don't have critical mass and revenue. So we need to change the statute to allow us to come up with a different calculation for new businesses. And give you a, an example, you know, we had a hotel here in my town of Williston that opened its doors in early February. Um, that hotel was unable to access any recovery dollars from this program. I don't think that was our intent. Uh, so we need to come up with a way to so they met the February 15th deadline that we put in the legislation, but they couldn't prove that they had a loss because we we're using March. So that's a really important legislative uh, change. And then the third legislative change we need for this $23 million is uh, we currently have a 50% cap. You know, you have to demonstrate at least a 50% loss. We took that from 75 down to 50. We think it's time to bring it down to 30. Uh, and we think that because we've now seen so many applications come in that uh, there are a lot of businesses missing it by five, 10%. And those businesses have as much of a loss uh, or will have as much of a loss over the next six months. So our, our, our calculation should be changed. And we're gonna propose to you that we change that as the legislation allows us, look at it quarterly over three months and you need to demonstrate a 30% loss over three months. Those are the three big changes. We talked a little about nonprofits. We'd like to change the nonprofit uh, definition or how, how we can fund nonprofits. And to representative uh, to the representative's point earlier, we, uh, we, we'd really like to, you, you to help us be explicit in how we want to help nonprofits. Uh, we've had to deny some really uh, valuable nonprofits in the state that don't have program service revenue. And so we're thinking, asking you to codify how you'd like us to calculate a nonprofit for grant eligibility. So that's, I, I think that's the only thing I want to go over. Everything else we'll talk about this afternoon, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman, but you tell me, take me on the wild ride and I'll go with you. You might not want to join us. I don't know. <laughs> I'm already on it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ted, I just want to be clear. Are, are you suggesting, you know, this program that you just outlined that um, it would have to happen legislatively? And if that's the case, you know, these businesses don't have that kind of time. Yeah, I am. We, we think um, 
we think to cover those three things, new businesses, uh, sole proprietors, and uh, the 30 percenters, we, need, we do need a legislative change and we also need more money. So we, we were asking you for $23 million and those legislative changes to help those businesses. And we know we, we have the system stood up. So from the time we get the money and the legislative change, we're a matter of a week or two away from being able to stand the program up. Wow. Charlie? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Ted. I asked while you were gone, I asked Joan this question, and it's about really long term economic recovery. As we look at even the $50 million for the hospitality and lodging sector, um, for a lot of businesses, is not going to be enough because their run rate is so high. So it comes down to not losing the fall and not losing that business uh, in this fall, not next fall, even though we, you're looking for the marketing money to make sure that people think about us in the future. So, wondering how. Uh, if the administration is going to be making some moves to model what other states have done, where you can open up to leisure travel in a safe way so that we don't lose that fall, we don't lose that business because so much of it is uh, important for local and regional economies. So is, can, can you speak to that? Yeah, every day we have a conversation about this with the doctors, with public safety, with DFR and with the governor's office. We're not there today. I sure hope that our leisure policy travel can be more relaxed coming into the fall. I don't see it, I don't see us eliminating having some quarantine requirements given how effective they've been to date. And also right now it's hard for me to look forward when I'm looking at school and wondering what school looks like and how the return to colleges goes. But every day we're talking about it and we're pushing to, we're, we're, we're pushing to make the most liberal policy we possibly can while keeping Vermonters safe. So yes, we know if we don't change the travel policy, we're not going to be able to. Um, we're not going to be able to substantially change the situation of these hospitality and the hospitality industry. They're directly tied. You know that. Yeah, and everything that goes with it. I mean, I just don't know how the Cape and the resorts on the Cape can make make a different policy and still have a low incidence of uh, infection, or other places how they can do that. And Vermont somehow is operating under a different guys, and yes, we have a very low infection rate, and that's great, but they're also able to achieve some kind of economic rebound, um, and we're, we're not uh, in that industry as much. You know, we're, we've been monitoring the uh, travel policies of the states surrounding us, and though we seem more restrictive, uh, in many cases, it's a similar policy expressed different ways. As an example, you know, Governor Baker just two weeks ago told people from Rhode Island they couldn't come to Massachusetts, period. So uh, you, because Rhode Island spiked. So they're, they're different in how they're worded and different in how they manifest. But in the end, the goal is all these states have policies in place to try to restrict hot zones from coming into their states. But we're, we're, we're constantly looking at ways to change it. We're with you. I, I understand what you're asking. I don't have the answer today, but it's not a static thing that we're saying, this is how it's gonna be for forever. Yeah, I'm just hoping for a higher occupancy rate, even from safe zones. So let's get all the people from Boston. Well, no, I didn't say all the people. <laughs> but uh, if we can get enough people to you know, generate that kind of revenue and, and frequent those businesses, then we'll be a lot better economically. Yeah, and safe. I'm, not sure, I'm sure you saw the VPR poll that showed that more than, I think it was more than 80% of Vermonters expressed concern about people traveling to Vermont for leisure. The way the question was asked in my mind led to a higher percentage at answering yes, but it's, it just demonstrates the balance we're trying to find, but we're with you. I, I don't need to say any more. I hear you loud and clear and we are pushing yeah. to change it and liberalize it. Yeah, I, I live in Northern Massachusetts and Western New York at this point or Eastern New York. Uh, and so I'd never before have people been so concerned about the license plates and where they're from. Uh, and it's, uh, but it, it, there is that, sure, that concern out there, but it's also a way to do it safely. And uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're right. That, that concern I think is throughout the state. It's up here in the kingdom. 
I hear it almost every day um, from my customers um, complaining about all the outside license plates that are that are up here. Um, and so, you know, it's it's some of that fear factor. Any other questions for Ted at this point? Okay, uh, Lynn. <laughs> I hate to um, hark back to the bad old days when I first moved here 47 years ago, but there was a lot of people who didn't want outsiders or flatlanders coming in. And if you got involved in your community, like on the school board, or you went to a select board meeting or something, they told you to go back where you came from. So this is not new. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, and I know I have run across people. Well, we don't go to Stowe. We will go to Jay Peak because Stowe is overrun with all kinds of people from out of state. I don't know that there's a hot spot over there or not, and it may not be fair, but that is how people look at it. And, um, and there's a lot of out of state people who come here and have moved in for their month or three months or they're buying houses. I mean, they're planning on doing remote work and they're hanging out, doing their work on the weeks and they all get out of state license plates, but they're all living here on a more semi-permanent basis than they would have before. So, yeah. you know, we have to be more cognizant. I mean, in these students, we'll see how the students do. That's a huge Petri dish of how um, out of state people are gonna be accommodated here. Lots, lots to see and understand. You know, on the college front, it's been interesting. Uh, they're the only uh, Vermonters that are receiving, uh, you know, a, a guaranteed test, right? So we know that these Vermonters, we're going to know real quickly. And I got to say, to date, uh, if I were a college student, I'd be more concerned with getting COVID from a uh, Vermonter than giving COVID to a Vermonter based on the testing so far. I hope that stays still, stays constant. Uh, I, one bad, uh, you know, group of tests to change that. But so far, we've been really lucky, and I think that's because our catchment area is generally doing well. To Representative Kimball's point, you know, Boston and New York aren't what they were four months ago. Uh, the problem is in the southeastern and west right now. So most of our college students come from the local catchment area as well. So. Uh, I'm committed to continuing to try to evolve our travel policy, and I know the governor is too the second he feels it's safe. Anything else? Okay, um, Ted, I think we can, you can take us off screen sharing. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I hope I... Uh... Oh, that's okay. That's good. Um, with nothing else, um, I think that we can wrap up now to give the committee an hour for lunch before we go to uh, sit down with approps and we'll see you in approps. Um, so Amy will be in touch. Um, I think by next Tuesday, David will have uh, that drafted for us so that we can really start getting into the meat of this um, with you guys and um, and start figuring out where we're going. We're, we are on an accelerated path, as Kitty said this morning on the floor. Um, so I think it's gonna be expected of us to get something out within a week and a half or so um, to appropriations, uh, probably a little quicker than that, maybe by the end of next week. Um, so as soon as I have that time frame, I'll let everybody know, but um, just wanna give you, Ted and Joan, a heads up um, of uh, we're gonna need, uh, your time, and I know you're gonna you're gonna get stretched thin again with having to go to uh, on the Senate side as well. So we'll do our best to uh, to work with you guys and uh, get get this uh, figured out so that we can uh, help the rest of Vermonters that that need the assistance. 